My name is Itai Anai, and I'm from the Technion at Israel. And uh, what we do in my lab is we study the organism from two parallel perspectives. We study both how the organism develops in real time, how it builds itself, and how the species uh, has evolved. And on a good day, looking at both of these two together, using this kind of Evo Devo approach, really does tell you something uh, insightful about the organism. And what I want to tell you about right now is our work on the origin of germ layers. So it's this kind of classical uh, observation that if you look at the embryo, there are three germ layers, the inside, the middle, and the outside. And this is, uh, for 150 years, has been one of these classical paradigms of developmental biology, of uh, evolution, cladistics, systematics. And uh, sometimes it's joked that, that the only thing medical students actually remember from their developmental biology course is that the inside uh, is made by the endoderm, and the outside, the ectoderm, and the middle layer is the mesoderm. However, despite this being such a um, well-known principle, there are still open questions. And here's uh, an interesting one. How did the germ layers evolve? Perhaps if we know how they evolved, we'll realize what kind of constraints are acting on the organism uh, right now. And if you look at all the animals, there are, are kind of two flavors. One are triploblastic. They have all three germ layers. And another kind has just two. And this is really good evidence that the third one, the mesoderm, is the latest one to evolve. And, and that's nice, but what about the other two, the ectoderm and the endoderm? It's not known, and there's no uh, convincing evidence that one preceded the other, or maybe they both arose simultaneously. And what we wanted to do is address this question using gene regulation. We thought that if we studied what every gene is doing, where it's expressed, and when, that could give us some sort of insight. So, as a model system, we use C. elegans. And this is a beautiful model system because it's very simple. There's a small number of cells. And yet, despite its simplicity, it actually has all the hallmarks of an animal. And it's, it's a good to work with. So here's a crash course in embryology. And I promise you, it'll be painless. You just have one cell at the beginning, right? It divides. You got two, four, eight. And at this eight cell stage, there's already a lot of fate that's been decided. So one cell in this eight cell stage is called the E. And only it makes the endoderm. No one else does. And that's already known. And, and you can take that cell out, culture it in the media, and it will still turn into endoderm. And the same for the other one. So we have the germ layers arising very early on. That's very convenient. So this allowed us to develop a system where we open up the embryo, tease apart the cells, culture them, and we just kind of watch this process occur. But what does that mean to watch this process? What do we actually measure? So to, to, what we wanted to do is ask, what is the gene expression level for all genes throughout all the times and across all of these uh, five lineages that, that comprise the germ layers? For this, we developed CellSeq. It's a single cell transcriptomics method that we developed in my lab. And what it allows you to do is to take a single cell and get the gene expression levels for all genes. And it works remarkably well but I won't get into that here. We use CellSeq, and here's the data that we got. For one gene, for example, here's the data. End one is not present in the beginning. There are just no transcripts of it early on in development. But then with time, it comes on. There are transcripts at abundance, and then it comes down. So we know when it's expressed. But we, remember, did five lineages, so we can also say where it's expressed. And we see here that it's green, which is uh, indicating the E lineage. So we know, hey, this gene is an endoderm gene. It's not an ectoderm, it's an endoderm gene. And remember that CellSeq works on all um, the genes. So we now can see for every single gene, is it an ectoderm gene, an endoderm gene? When is it coming on? And that's a tremendous resource. And here's what we did with this resource to study our question of the origin of germ layers. We divided the genes into their time of expression. So for every temporal period, we said, hey, which genes are coming on right now? And of those genes that are coming on, we classified them into ectoderm, mesoderm, endoderm, or like all of them. And we saw, first of all, a nice trend where if you look early on, a lot of the genes that are expressed are everywhere. They're ubiquitous they're, because the germ layers haven't been enunciated yet. But with time, the expression becomes more and more specific, just like you would expect. But then what was surprising is that if you look at where are the mesoderm genes expressed, the mesoderm genes are expressed at the end. And that was really fascinating for us because it's a system now where 
the mesoderm evolved last and it also develops last every time the organism builds itself. And if you now extend this logic, you can now ask about the endoderm and the ectoderm. We saw that the endoderm genes, surprisingly, precede the ectoderm. First the endoderm program comes on and then the ectoderm program. To further test this, this uh, notion now that the endoderm was the first germ layer, we looked into gene age. For every gene, and now we have about 500 genes that are endoderm, 500 for ectoderm, and about the same for mesoderm. We asked, what are the gene ages? What's a gene age? Well, you just take a phylostratigraphic approach where you ask, what's the phylogenetic depth of a particular gene? How deeply do you see their orthologs? For example, polymerase, all cells, right? Bacteria, too, have polymerase. It's a very ancient gene. But histone, it's more restricted. It's newer. So now you can take all the genes, look at different times, and, and now say, OK, of these genes, what fraction are old? What about this uh, set of genes? What fraction of these are old? And what you see is, uh, if you look at all the genes, the genes that are expressed in the middle of embryology are older. And that actually uh, validates an observation that was made in Drosophila and in zebrafish. And it's very interesting why in the middle there should be older genes, but I won't get into that here. What I want to draw your attention to is that now we can take our sets of genes, the germ layer genes, and ask what's their ages. And the mesoderm genes are, are younger. And we can see that because they have the smallest fraction of old genes. The ectoderm genes are older than the mesoderm, and the endoderm genes are oldest still. So this gene age analysis also supported the notion that the endoderm genes, for some reason, are, are unique. They're comprised of older genes, as though when the endoderm first evolved, it incorporated the genes that were available at the time, which were older than the genes that were incorporated later on when the ectoderm arose. We then looked in the sponge. We took our sets of genes, mapped their orthologs, looked at the expression profile of the orthologs. For the ectoderm and the endoderm, we didn't see uh, temporally restricted expression in the sponge, as you would expect, because it's just a sponge. It doesn't, it's not supposed to have any germ layers at all, if you look at the zoology textbooks. But when we looked at our endoderm orthologs, we saw a significant uh, set of genes that are coming on at a particular stage early on. And if you look at this stage, if, uh, it's called the brown stage. At this stage in sponge development, it's the first time where two layers appear. And, and there's also been recent in situ work where a GADA ortholog, this is a, an end, a classical endoderm genes, is expressed in the internal layer, suggesting that the sponge has a proto-endoderm. And that's really fascinating. So what could this possibly mean when we claim now that the endoderm was first? So, Leo Buss, uh, a number of years ago, proposed the following uh, interesting observation. We animals arise from a particular line of eukaryotes that has a very specific restriction. We cannot undergo mitosis and extend the flagella at the same time. Every time we undergo mitosis, we draw in the flagella. Every single animal cells cannot do it. We're just wired that way. Now, if you imagine a colony of single-cell eukaryotes, they face a problem because if they're undergoing, undergoing mitosis, they're swimming slower, right? Because they're drawing in their flagella. So they're, they're facing a, a uh, risk cost. However, what Leo Buss said is that perhaps gastrulation originated as a solution to this problem where you have an invagination of cells inside. Once inside, those cells are now free from this constraint. They don't need to have a flagella. They're inside. And now, what well, we're extending uh, this model, uh, we're extending it by saying that now, upon being inside, these cells can then differentiate into an endoderm program, while the outside <coughs> coanoflagellate uh, cells are restricted. So that by this model, you can have just a single uh, layer because the, the external is just a, a normal kind of flagellate. And then if you then speculate that the eggshell evolved next, then the external layer is also free to differentiate into a new program, and that would be uh, the origin of the ectoderm. But it would be markedly later than the origin of the endoderm. So that was the, uh, the uh, evidence that we have, and, and you can see if that convinces you that the endoderm was the first germ layer. So uh, I want to thank Tamar Hashimshoni in my lab. She uh, not only did all of the uh, experiments in this work, but also developed the CellSeq protocol. Uh, and also uh, Michal and Martin helped her, and Professor Brian Hall 
uh, is also helping us with this project. I also want to thank the other members of the lab and thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you.